Yes. Good evening everyone, thank you for joining us at the Constitution Unit for our event on the election replay with the experts. Um, I'm joined by um, <coughs> Professor Ben Lordsdale, who's a Professor of Political Science uh, here at UCL and one of the brains behind the MLP. Um, Dr Sophia Collignon from Royal Holloway, who's a lecturer in political communication, and is going to talk to us about the candidates who stood in the election and what we can tell from them. Uh, Dr. Alan Rennick, the Deputy Director of the Constitution Unit, who's going to talk about the performance of uh, campaign rules and of uh, electoral legislation. And Professor Meg Russell, Director of the Constitution Unit, who's going to talk about the political dynamics of the new Parliament um, and look ahead to what the election means for the future. Uh, so each of them are going to talk for about six to eight minutes, um, and then we'll open up the floor to audience questions. So do be thinking of what you'd like to ask them. Uh, we'll be wrapping up around 7.15, 7.30. Um, but with no more from me, I'll be there. Okay, terrific. Um, I'm just going to say a few words about sort of polling in general and expectations for this election, um, and then talk a little bit about sort of the finer details, partly of the work that we did trying to make constituency level predictions and sort of talking about how the, the changes that we saw across the country in different kinds of seats um, played out as expected or perhaps as it will turn out more than expected. Um, so in terms of the polling in general, after the sort of general problems in 2015 with all the pollsters getting the story wrong and then very good results in 2017 where some of the pollsters got things wrong and some of them got them right. Um, one of the things that happened this time which isn't being much remarked upon because it ceases to be interesting when you know it, when all the pollsters get it right is that all the pollsters more or less got it right. I mean there, there were varying degrees of exactly how big the, the conservative lead was. By and large, almost all pollsters were reporting leads that under any reasonable assumptions were going to translate into a majority um, for the conservatives. And so um, in that sense, it ceases to be a story, um, which is good in some sense for um, you know both, both the pollsters as pollsters, but also um, people were having, in some sense, the right conversation or a plausible conversation in the lead up to this election about sort of, you know, a conservative majority and whether that was something that people wanted. And it turned out that given that conversation, you know, enough people answered the question in the affirmative. Um, one of the things that I think was quite interesting in this election was it wasn't just that there was this that the sort of the national narrative was more or less on target on that question, um, but the sort of the details were not far off either. I mean, the, the focus pretty early in the election was on the Workington man, um, the red wall, um, you know, aside from the silly name, um, the, the, this was in fact where the, the action in this election was focused um, in terms of seat changes, you know, by and large the conservative gains, which are most of the story of what actually happened in terms of change in this election were where ex exactly where people were looking, um, both based on sort of qualitative reporting and also based on the kind of modeling that we were doing, which focused attention on places that many people found it difficult to imagine the conservatives gaining because Labour had been holding those seats for 25, 50, 75, 100 years, sort of in some cases, as long as the Labour Party has been a significant entity in um, in, in British electoral politics, um, but nonetheless, you know, it was sort of clear in advance. And when we released estimates for each constituency two weeks out, you know, we had places like Sedgefield going conservative. Um, <coughs> We, you know, the, the work that I did suggested things had closed a little bit um, in in the last two weeks, which turned out not to be the case. Work turned out to have reversed in the last two days, but a great deal of the story of this election was the disproportionate labor losses in the kinds of places where they have held seats for a long time, but where Leave did very well. And so I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna skip through most of this, which is uh, apologia for for my own work. Um, I'll mention this, that sort of we under predicted conservative gains. We had sort of 339 at the end rather than 364. Most of the mispredictions were places we expected to be very narrow labor holds and which tipped over because we were a little bit off on the national margin. Um, 
this is the important story, though, of what happened. You know, so before the election, we were predicting that the y-axis here is the conservative labor margin swing, sort of how, how much the conservative minus labor um, vote was going to move. This is what we predicted by leave share in the constituency, and you can see this pretty stark upward turn um, in the leave majority seats where the conservatives were gaining a lot more in those places. This is what actually happened, which was even more so. So the, the difference between remain seats in what happened to conservative minus labor and what happened in the most leave supporting states was even starker than what we predicted. And that sort of, you know, this is the difference between those two. And that really was the, you know, why this was not, you know, 340, 350, but was 300, you know, 64, 365, um, was that in fact, you know, the the different, you know, the different dynamics in heavily leave seats versus remain seats were was an even bigger thing than I think people certainly than we we were able to extract from our data analysis and, and perhaps than people anticipated in part because everyone has a long political memory and it's very hard for people who've been thinking about British politics for a long time to imagine some of those seats going conservative given both the swings that were required and also the political history. So I think what <clears throat> should just quickly sum up, um, hopefully I've stayed close to time, um, I think in some sense the story of the polls is mostly a non-story, but it's that largely they were pointing in the right direction and sending the right message about what was happening, and if anything they underestimated the degree to which things were moving in that direction, but um, the, the story was, was certainly pointed in the right way. Perfectly in time, thank you. But for re-election again, and they cited harassment, abuse, and intimidation as a reason not to do so. This has sparked a lot of uh, discussions in the media um, about what is the role, what is the effect that harassment is having on political, on female political ambition, and whether this will affect descriptive and um, substantive representation in the future. In order to be able to answer these questions, we really need to look into detail, in detail, uh, to the composition of. Um, of candidates, how they were formed, which party they were represented, and the gender distribution. So first, in general, we observe, um, or we have this year, 20 more candidates than in 2017. And this gives us an average of 5.1 candidates per constituency. Of course, there is some variation across regions in the number of candidates standing. Um, a total of 608 former MPs uh, started for re-election. And this included some MPs that were not sitting in previous parliament but were, have been MPs before. In terms of gender, yes, despite of the, dis uh, of the discussion and all the noise that has been made about how harassment will affect female um, ambition, uh, the ambition of women studying in politics, we have said that a record uh, number of women were presenting themselves for election. This is a record 37%, and here you can see the distribution. Uh, however, well, a lot, again, like, I mean, it's, it's very good to know that a record number of women are presenting themselves for office. However, we are still far from parity because in the country, 51% of uh, the UK are women, so basically we should aim to have about 50% of women in parliament as well. If This is if we refer only to the descriptive representation. Um, but it's important also to recognize that there is important differences across parties. The Conservative Party only presented 31%, uh, about 31% of the candidates were female. And for the first time in history, one of the parties presented more women than men. For election, this is the Labour Party, uh, which gave us 53% of women, uh, of female candidates. This is an increase of 11%. This is an important increase, but not the largest one we observe. The largest one comes across uh, the Lib Dems, which went from 26% to 30%. Um, I'm sorry, gave us an increase of 26% um, in the number of women in So imagine how many, uh, like, few number of female candidates that they have before. Uh, for the Conservative uh, Party, it's only an increase of 1%. And why I'm mentioning this distribution of the differences across parties is because that reflects, again, in, um, in the number of women that, um, that would go um, or will be MPs in the future. Because we observe that the Labour Party had more female candidates than the, 
the rest of the parties, but also that the Conservative Party have considerably more, uh, fewer women standing for office. That translated the composition, and we can see that again for the first time uh, in history, one party will have more women than men as MPs, and this is the Labour Party. We observe how the majority of the women that will be part of the House of Commons. This is again a record because now it's going to be 34%, which is an increase of 5% compared to uh, the last parliament. But however, the majority of women will go to sit in opposition and they will not have government. And this is because of the distribution of, uh, of candidates that we observed before. Um, in general, we can think about two different paths in which women are getting um, a city parliament, one is when they present themselves for election and then they win against incumbent. There we don't find any differences between the likelihood of a man or a woman to win in an election. However, what we find are important significant differences in the number of women that um, get a seat when the incumbent is stepped down. And here we see that 65% of women stepping down are being replaced by other women and about 43% of men stepping down are being replaced by women. So we find that women have ac or are accessing to seats that are being left. <coughs> Um, however, previous research, so now you can ask, okay, how that relates to harassment and intimidation, so let me come back to the original question. Uh, in previous research, we observed that, or we asked candidates if they have suffered any form of harassment or intimidation while they were campaigning for office. And 38% answered positively to this question. However, we observed also significant differences between men and women, with one in every two women uh, campaigning suffer any form of abuse. This is a very large number considering that the UK is an otherwise peaceful country. Um, so this indicates that women are being targeted uh, while they campaign. So in this specific period when they are seeking a political career, they are being especially vulnerable to these actions. And this holds even if we control for incumbency, party, the region, um, et uh, ethnicity, but also for the competitiveness on the race. Um, <coughs> so we observe that on average, women are 8% more likely to be harassed than men when they are uh, campaigning. So in conclusion, we observe that well, all that indicates or has important implications because on the one hand, we don't observe that harassment and intimidation is affecting the number of women that want to participate in politics or that present themselves for, um, for election. However, we do observe that once they have been, uh, they have passed this initial stage, they are being targeted. So in the long term, we might observe that more women are entering into politics, but also that more women have to be replaced because they have to step down if uh, basically the abuse become unsustainable. So women are alone, women are still participating in elections. Uh, we observe a record number of women standing for office. There is important variations across uh, parties, so not all parties are making the same effort or the same <coughs> commitment uh, on this regard. Um, and there is going to be also a record number of women sitting in parliament. However, the majority of them will be in opposition. Research shows that women are more likely to be targeted when they campaign for office, and we can think that this might have uh, an effect in the future on substantive representation, but also on the career and political ambition of women in politics. Thank you. Uh, so yes, I'm going to talk about the rules of the election, um, which means um, two things. Firstly, the electoral system, the rules through which we um, vote and, and translate those votes into seats, and secondly, the rules of the campaign period. So, with regard to the electoral system, I'll offer us four criteria by which we might uh, judge the performance of the electoral system in this vote. The first one, um, so, uh, first past the post electoral system, sorry, I should have said, first past the post electoral system, as you all know, 650 constituencies <laughs> around the country. So, a first past the post electoral system is intended to deliver a single party majority. That's what it is supposed to be good for. As you know, the electoral system this time is exactly that. So we see for the first time since 2005, the electoral system did manage to do what it was supposed to do and produce a clear governing majority for the largest party. So in that sense, all good. Um, in addition, we would hope that the electoral system <coughs> delivers that objective without uh, too much um, manufacturing of that majority. So if the electoral base of the largest party is rather small, but it still gets a majority, we would think that rather problematic. 
So we can see that in this case, the government, uh, the Conservatives, got 43.6% of the vote, um, and that's the basis on which they got a majority of the seats. The lower line there, the green line, shows the percentage of the total electorate, uh, all those eligible to vote, so allowing for the fact that some people did not turn out to vote, and they secured 29.3% of that. So you can see that those numbers are pretty comparable to other recent elections. In fact, in eight out of the last 11 elections, the winning party has secured between 40 and 44 percent of the vote, and um, apart from in 2017, on that basis, has secured a majority. So the electoral system worked as it normally works. Um, of course, you might question whether it's a good thing that we manufacture majorities from the low 40s percent, but it did what it normally does. Just to illustrate that even further, um, this shows the, um, the vote share of part of each party, sorry, of the winning party compared to the seat share of the winning party in each election since 1945. So if we had a perfectly proportional system, the vote share of the winning party uh, was equal to its seat share, then the, part, the, the, the dots would be on the, the diagonal line there. They're almost all above the line because first past the post advantage is the largest party. The one dot below the line is in 2010 when there are two parties in the governing coalition. So that's the, the combined vote and seat share of the two parties. And because the Liberal Democrats were underrepresented, uh, overall uh, the, the coalition had a lower seat share than vote share. Um, but you can see generally uh, governing parties are overrepresented, and this election, the Conservatives in this election have the red dot, as you might have been expecting, so they're right in the middle of how the electoral system normally performs. Again, we might think that degree of gap between the diagonal and where we are is problematic, but this election was no more problematic in this, in this sense than other recent elections. <coughs> in terms of the proportionality of the electoral system, so the overall degree of fit between the vote shares and the seat shares of the political parties, we generally think that more proportionality, other things being equal, is better than less proportionality. There are a number of indicators that we can use, what measures that we can use in order to gauge proportionality. This again shows the pattern in proportionality using two of those measures uh, since 1945. The last election in 2017 saw the lowest disproportionality. So this shows disproportionality. The lowest disproportionality in uh, the overall electoral results since 1970 because we saw a return to a two-party system in effect. There weren't very many small parties that were being underrepresented. This time we see a bit of a rise up again in the level of disproportionality because the, principally because the Liberal Democrats get more votes but fewer seats. Um, but the overall level of disproportionality is still at the lower level uh, if we compare with other recent elections since the expansion of the party system in the 1970s. Um, interestingly, those sorts of differences can still make an important difference to the result. So if we just add up the proportion of the vote won by parties supporting Brexit and parties supporting the referendum, the latter won the majority. Uh, of course, that is not to say that uh, the pro-Brexit party's Conservatives did not win a legitimate uh, victory in the election, uh, but they certainly can't claim that they got um, a, majority, a clear majority vote for getting on with Brexit, as Boris Johnson did uh, on Friday morning. Um, final criterion, uh, voter choice. We can look at this in many, many ways. I don't have time to do them all, so I won't. Um, but just uh, one very quickly is to think about the degree to which voters have a party that they feel <coughs> represents their ideological <laughs> view. We tend to think of ideological space as having two dimensions, a left-right dimension in economic terms and a socially liberal to socially conservative uh, dimension. The traditional British party system was one in which the, the socially liberal to conservative dimension didn't matter terribly much. The dominant dimension was left-right competition. There was a party on the left and a party on the right. Basically, everyone was happy, reasonably happy, just even with, within the context of a two-party system. Um, if we move to what I'll call the Blair Cameron party system, um, then firstly we have increasing salience of the socially liberal to conservative dimension alongside the left-right dimension. Secondly, we increasingly see that the main parties are 
clearly located on that dimension towards the liberal end. Most party, uh, most LPs, leading party figures are uh, educated, metropolitan people like a lot of people in this room tend to be socially liberal, which leaves a lot of space down here people feeling un unrepresented. That, of course, gives rise to UKIP, eventually Brexit Party. Uh, they, of course, cannot get a, a, a representation under the first-past-the-post system. We might think that contributed to the Brexit referendum result. Then we have the current election, where we see quite dramatic shifts in the party system. The Labour shifts towards the left. The Conservatives... Are, so I should have said first, I've, I've relabeled this, this dimension, the anti-Brexit to pro-Brexit dimension, which roughly maps onto the socially liberal to conservative dimension, unless you're Jeremy Corbyn. Um, uh, so we, we find Labour moving to the left, the Conservatives clearly locating themselves on the pro-Brexit end, but trying to get some of the votes here and here as well. Large areas are left blank in this setup. Um, so voters in large areas of the map struggle to find someone they want to vote for. Where do people on the left who are pro-Brexit go? Um, we saw very clearly the, the agonising that went on among many of these voters. And where do all of these people up here go? Well, is it sort of generally centrist or, or even slightly to the right people um, who oppose Brexit? Real challenge for them in deciding where to vote. So, uh, and also some tactical voting difficulties, of course, for those uh, in this kind of area. So, big difficulties with voter choice. Um, I think I'm almost out of time already. Aren't I? So, uh, very quick word on campaign rules. Many things have been said um, in recent months about how our campaign rules are not fit for purpose. In particular, they uh, don't deal adequately with online. Campaigning. The rules were written before online campaigning was a thing, uh, and, and they, there are also problems with political finance. So there have been many calls to improve the transparency of the rule. Nothing has been done, uh, by government at least. Uh, the tech companies have stepped in and introduced various changes. So they've introduced their ad libraries in the case of uh, Facebook and Google, for example. Twitter has simply banned all political advertising on its platform. Um, but that has clearly been inadequate, um, partly just because it's inadequate that tech companies rather than democratic process should decide fundamental democratic rules, um, but partly also the information that they provide is often very weak. And furthermore, clearly, all of that intervention from the, the, those companies didn't prevent a vast amount of misinformation during this campaign. Um, we saw huge information from all three of the main parties as well as the minor parties as well. So we've had real, real problems in this campaign. We clearly need further action uh, in order to tackle that. And I might save this time in the Q&A to talk about this. Thing. Thank you, Alan. Okay, uh, so it's my role to um, essentially speak about the thing that we're left with as a result of this election, which is Holland. Um, and I'm going to just skate over a few things um, very briefly. Firstly, I can't resist um, asking how we got here, uh, what happened before the election. And of course, really quite a lot happened, just, um, to, just to list a small number of things. Uh, well, we kicked off with what the Public Administration and Constitutional Reform, the Constitutional Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, referred to as a bluff call referendum, a referendum in 2016 on EU membership, um, which was not called because politicians wanted the change, it was called because they wanted the pressure for the change to go away. Um, that creates an evident tension inside Parliament when in fact people vote for change. Um, we, David Cameron had a small majority, um, Theresa May gambled on getting a bigger one and ended up with a minority <laughs> government. Um, and subsequent to that, of course, we saw repeated uh, defeats in Parliament, huge whopping defeats in Parliament of her uh, withdrawal agreement. Um, we saw parliamentarians famously trying to seize the agenda in the House of Commons. We saw what were referred to as indicative votes on different Brexit options, all of which failed. Um, we saw parliamentarians forcing the Prime Minister to seek um, an extension to the Article 50 period, including forcing that through um, private members' legislation against the wishes of the government. 
Uh, we saw when Boris Johnson arrived, an unlawful prorogation of Parliament. Um, we saw, um, following the return of Parliament, a lot of angry rhetoric about the role of Parliament. That's Geoffrey Cox, the Attorney General, uh, saying that this Parliament has no moral right to sit. Um, we then... Um, <coughs> In, uh, we then saw, uh, my, my, my order has changed here, uh, Boris Johnson bringing back a new deal and a rejection not actually of the bill to get his deal through, but of the programme motion for his bill, the timetable for his bill. And that resulted, of course, in the end, in the calling of a general election after he had been denied several times a general election by the House of Commons. In short, we've been on something of a roller coaster ride. Parliament has been fascinating. It's been at the centre of the news. Um, and, you know, it's been a time unlike any other. Parliament has been very interesting. Um, and then we had the general election. And a bit like Ben, uh, who said that the polls ceased to be a story, uh, maybe we're going to see the same for Parliament. For a lot of people, that might be a good thing. For people who study Parliament, it's a bit of a disappointment. Um, we're going to have to find something new to do. It has been such an interesting time. So what does the Parliament ahead look like? Well, I think some of these things are fairly obvious. Uh, the House of Commons is going to get a great deal easier for the government to handle. Uh, we have a Conservative majority uh, of 80 seats. I would have to say as somebody who studied Parliament for years, a majority government is not necessarily dull. It doesn't not have to compromise with Parliament. It does have to compromise and discuss things and negotiate with its backbenchers. But a majority of 80 is pretty big. He's got a lot of freedom. Furthermore, of course, at least in the short term, the opposition is very weak. Uh, feeling rather kind of broken and fractured as a result of the election results. Um, there's going to be a lot, there are a lot of new MPs coming in. I think there are 100 new Conservative MPs. These people are going to take time to find their feet. They're not going to be very bold, probably, initially. They're probably going to be pretty loyal, particularly on um, Brexit. Um, but it's not all... Uh, necessarily boring. Um, because the uh, majority is so large, um, it, I'm guessing that there will be some people arriving in Parliament that the Conservative front bunch weren't necessarily expecting, exceeding even Ben's uh, predictions of the results. There may be some rather unknown candidates arriving. We saw this after 97 with Blair's majority, some people who sort of weren't quite as in line as uh, the, the front bench might have hoped. Um, and with a bigger majority, there is some sort of temptation to form factions within that big group. So a, a smaller majority can in some ways, a sort of majority maybe of 30 or 40 might have been easier to manage in some ways than one of 80. Um, and that's the House of Commons, of course. The House of Lords might actually get a bit harder to handle. The House of Lords has a way of stepping in when the House of Commons is not putting up much resistance to ensure that the government is under scrutiny. Um, the, um, this is the first time that we've actually had a solid uh, Conservative majority since Lords reform in 1999. So the Conservatives are facing a House of Lords where they do not have a majority. Um, so that could be quite challenging for them. It was challenging for Labour when they were in government. It may be challenging for this Conservative government. But, there is again a but, the Lords is always quite cautious. And actually at the moment, I think they may be fearful somewhat of some of the rhetoric that's come from Dominic Cummings, Jacob Rees-Mogg, the threat that they'll put in hundreds of peers. Um, and we know that they're not, this is not an, an administration which is terribly sort of respectful of the traditional way that things have been done. So those threats could come to pass if the Lords makes too much trouble. What's immediately coming? Obviously we have the Withdrawal Agreement Bill um, to get Brexit done by the 31st of January. We're expecting that to be introduced on Friday. It's not yet clear whether it will actually be debated on Friday, but I suspect it will. The Speaker needs to give permission for first reading and second reading to be taken on one day. We don't know how long um, the second reading will be. Um, it's unlikely, I would have thought, for it to be done by Christmas, but we'll see. The things to look out for with the bill are firstly the programme motion. Uh, of course it was defeated before, they proposed only three days for the Commons. I would hope that this time they will propose longer, but whatever they propose, that it's going to be agreed. 
And then there are aspects of parliamentary oversight, which were in the original withdrawal agreement bill introduced by Johnson before the election. It will be interesting to see if those are still there. So one of those is parliamentary oversight of the negotiating objectives for the next phase. Another one, crucially, is parliamentary oversight, the requirement for parliamentary approval if Johnson seeks an extension to the length of the transition period. This is something he absolutely doesn't want to do. He's sworn over and over again he's not going to do it. But most experts think it will be very difficult to get an agreement through by the end of 2020. If I were Boris Johnson, I would be taking parliamentary approval of that out of this bill to ensure that he's got more wiggle room and he doesn't need to come back to Parliament uh, to get an approval to the for an extension uh, if he changes his mind. But let's wait and see until Friday. There are lots of things in the bill which are likely to be contentious. We're going to hear a lot about Northern Ireland, obviously, the DUP and other Northern Ireland parties are not going to stop objecting to the deal. There are going to be lots of arguments about the amount of delegated powers in the bill, particularly uh, from the House of Lords. So that's a bit of an early test for them. Um, what else is coming up? Very briefly, uh, we're going to see the return of some of this other the other legislation which fell with the prorogation. There's time for that during the transition period on things like agriculture, fisheries, trade. Those bills all fell. Um, we will be watching uh, the degree of parliamentary oversight of the transition. This is a new thing for Parliament. We'll have to see how they organise themselves um, and how many difficult questions they ask in both chambers. Um, there are questions uh, being asked about the reorganisation of government, the suggestions that DEXU, the Department for Exiting the EU, is going to be abolished. If that happens, it will have a knock-on effect for the um, DEXU committee, chaired by Hilary Benn in the House of Commons. That would also go. This actually throws into some question the timetable for electing these <coughs> committees, because if DEXU isn't abolished until the end of January, they want to get on with electing the select committees before then. This is slightly awkward timetable-wise. And then the Lords as well, don't forget, uh, has recently had a review of its committee system. At the centre of the House of Lords committee system is the European Union Committee. Uh, they had in the end to report a rather timid report not suggesting much reform to the Lords committee system because it really wasn't clear whether we were Brexiting. Well, now it's clear we are. Maybe they're going to restart that process. The final thing I'll mention, um, which lots of people are talking about, is the words in the Conservative Party manifesto, the famous page 48, uh, which has an impact on Parliament in the future and potential parliamentary reform. Three things in there. Um, the abolition of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. I can't resist putting sick there because people get really aggravated by the hyphenation and capitalisation of that. And uh, it does, doesn't actually read like that, officially. Um, then this famous line about needing to look at the broader aspects of our constitution, relationship between government, parliaments and courts and functioning of the royal prerogative, which is making a lot of people very nervous. Um, and one for Alan, which I won't say anything about, about updating the parliamentary boundaries. I mean, not you ask Alan about that. Um, the first two of those, I would say, um, are really born by the tensions that arose under the minority <coughs> government. Um, and I would question now whether the government is going to think that these are such a priority anymore. But the commitment is in the manifesto, and it's one that they ought to be delivering on because it's there. Likewise, there have been questions about whether we need reviews to Parliament to co Commons procedures because of all of the seasoning of the agenda, etc. Again, um, is that going to be a priority anymore now that they've got a majority? All of these kind of problems are going to melt away. One thing I think that maybe we can all agree, whichever side of these arguments we're on, is that we have been pretty disastrous at handling minority government. The government didn't handle it well, parliament didn't handle it well, and I think if there's one thing that needs reviewing, it's maybe how that worked and how we can do it better in the future. And uh, the start point for that might be the report that uh, Robert Hazel, the former director of the unit, published in 2009, which makes some pretty interesting reading. Thank you. Thank you very much to all our panellists. We're now going to open up the floor to questions. Um, I'll take them in groups of three so that um, you know, all of our panellists can tackle them. Um, so, so we'll start here at the front, um, the gentleman at the back, um, and the gentleman here in the Sorry, apologies. Sorry. Okay, my apologies for late arrival. I don't think this, this question was addressed before I arrive. But most major political parties have 
are significant coalitions of factions. It does seem to me that in this election, the destruction of the one nation wing and the three independent candidates, <coughs> Boris Johnson has a control of the Conservative Party, which is unprecedented since Churchill, with members of the panel have commented about that. Okay, thank you very much. Gentlemen at the back. Um, I've listened to many debates on the television, and, it, and what seemed to me to be going on was a, a greatly increased propensity to jeer at people on the panel. And I wonder whether uh, our experts think that that's a reflection <coughs> of increased division among the electorate, accepting that there are some trolls, but I don't uh, mean that. Or uh, it, it, is it the way that the TV organisations select their audiences? <laughs> Thank you. And uh, The Conservatives didn't win a majority for, for leaving the EU in Scotland or Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you didn't comment on the implications when and how the government is likely to respond to <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. So we have um, unprecedented control of the Conservative Party, a division in the electorate and how that comes out, uh, particularly in public forums, um, and the question about you know, differential results across the UK. Um, ben, would you like to pick that up please? Um, I'm not sure I have a great deal to say about this, but on the, on the last one about um, differential results across the UK, I mean, it, the, there, there's been no signal from the government during the election period or before that they will be in any way responsive to that different, you know, those different electoral <laughs> results in in the different parts of the UK. Those existed in previous elections. They existed in the referendum. Um, you know, given the choice of, you know. People have used the phrase throwing under the DUP under the bus. Um, that was the choice they made to resolve what was otherwise a series of irreconcilable um, constraints. Um, I think there's very little reason to think that that will change, certainly in the near, in, in the coming you know, year, figuring out how to get through the immediate deadlines for, for Brexit. Um, whether the Conservative Party sort of, you know, at the end of next year, sort of looks at this situation and has a plan for uh, for trying to, you know, claw back some of their reputation in those in those parts of the country. I think is is unclear, and and certainly I have no special insight into into the Conservative Party's thinking of um, how to how to approach particularly Scotland, but um, also Northern Ireland in the in the coming Parliament. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, I think it's interesting, especially in the last one, like, I will refer more to the question on whether the electorate is polarized or is the audiences, the selected audiences, I think it's both. So, on the one hand, we have an issue that is highly divisive, and yes, of course, I mean, people have a strong opinions, and I believe that in general, if it's a discussion that is going to be affecting your rights, especially for example the right to free movement or um, economic performance of the country, I think it's, uh, people feel strongly about it. And of course there is this echo chamber part when you choose the media that actually resonates with your own views and that doesn't help to build consensus, but in reality I think it's partly is how political elites are being, have been talking about one specific subject, um, picking up the um, Positions and that are very strong and cut line, and that just reflects on the type of news that people read. Um, um, so I don't think I agree with what you said about the Conservative Party. Actually, um, I mean it became incredibly divided on the Brexit issue in the last few years. Um, so in comparison with that, we'll probably see something a bit less extreme. And, and certainly on specifically the Brexit issue, as Meg indicated, it seems likely that MPs, Conservative MPs on the whole, whole are going to toe the party line because Boris Johnson has just been elected to do one thing and one thing only and we all know what it is. Um, but there is still huge diversity of opinion on Brexit from Steve Brine to Steve Baker. <laughs> um, there's still 
huge diversity of opinion on immigration. You know, one of the issues uh, within the Brexit debate, even among the Brexiteers, from Boris Johnson to um, uh, sorry, uh, I've forgotten the name of his uh, Home Secretary manager. What's the name of his Home Secretary? Patel. Thank you. From <laughs> Boris Johnson to Priti Patel, um, and then. Clearly, one of the effects of the um, the shift in the Conservative Party towards northern towns uh, is that Boris Johnson will feel the need to uh, uh, deliver on the promises he made to those people in those towns in terms of economic policy, in terms of delivering in, 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 in infrastructure investment and healthcare better healthcare, all these things. So there's going to be huge division within the Conservative Party on the economic dimension, dimension between the traditional uh, low-tax uh, wing of the party and where Boris Johnson seems to be thinking of taking the party. So I think the Conservative Party is going to be quite fun uh, in terms of its internal divisions uh, from now on. I agree with what others have said about the propensity to jeer. Um, so um, we are a more divided society than we've been in the past, um, but it also uh, social media make us shout at each other more. I think the broadcasters in particular have an important responsibility to do something about that and not just feed it. So, so far they have been inclined to think that they maximise audience by um, appealing to the desire for a shouting match. It strikes me that they have a far more important responsibility to uh, foster more considered debate, uh, and they need to take that seriously. Uh, and I'll shut up. <laughs> um, many good things have been said. I think I, on the Conservative Party, I would go back um, to uh, to the point that I made during my presentation that it, in some important respects we don't really know because we don't entirely know who these hundred new people are. And so we assume that, and I think we rightly assume that in the short term, he's going to face practically no resistance to getting this bill through the House of Commons by the end of January. But after that, once people have found their feet, you know, I mean, one of the... the, the <sighs> One of the things I think that contributed to the growth of uh, rebellion over the last 20 years or so was actually that Tony Blair's majority in some respects was too large. It was too easy uh, for groups to form in opposition to the leader. It was too boring for them all to stick together. So it is going to be quite interesting to see how that develops. I think we don't entirely know. And many of the One Nation Tories, and many of them left, but many of them are still there. Um, so I guess I guess we will see. Um, there hasn't been much said in response to Titus on Scotland and Wales, and um, Alan is better qualified um, on both of these things than me because he's running a project on Northern Ireland, and he is of course the Scot on the panel. Um, but let me have a little go. Uh, one thing that strikes me um, is that the Alan was looking at the different dimensions on here, the Brexit dimension and the left-right dimension. The thing that was not represented, of course, on that chart was the independence. Um, the, you know, the independence slash union dimension in either of those places where it is hugely important, even dominant. Um, and over the last few days, um, uh, Nicola Sturgeon has been claiming that there is a mandate for independence in Scotland and that Boris Johnson needs to give her her referendum and so on. And personally, I think that Boris Johnson would be quite justified in turning around to her and saying, I'm not convinced you do have a mandate. Um, they all voted to remain, didn't they? Um, I mean, all of the tactical voting websites were urging people to vote SNP if they wanted to block Boris Johnson. And so it's very difficult to read, <coughs> I think. In Northern Ireland, I just wonder whether <coughs> now that um, he has this comfortable majority, you know, the question everybody's asking me about which Boris Johnson are we going to see, whether he will attempt any healing with Northern Ireland um, if he moves to a softer version of Brexit, which some people are predicting or hoping that he will, and other people are saying is a crazy thing to think he'll do, um, he might be able to ease some of those tensions. But again, I think we just don't know. I just add one more thing on Scotland. I mean, the, it's it's not clear that it isn't in Johnson's interest to have a long fight about Scottish independence with the SNP, because to the extent that he can make the Conservative Party in Scotland, which held up a bit better than expected by some, and and you know, and if he can make that 
the party of unionism in Scotland, that is still either a, it's a narrow majority position in Scotland. And you know, if he can mix Scottish politics about that rather than left-right politics, there are probably more seats for the conservatives in that. Um, and so it's not clear that that isn't a fight that he would be perfectly happy to have drawn out for the entire length of the parliament. <laughs> Right, we'll have another round of questions, and I'd love to hear from the women in the audience as well. Yeah. Please. <laughs> Doesn't mean you have to put your hands down. <laughs> um, so, Lottie, uh, and then the gentleman behind you, and the gentleman in the blue show. Um, okay, thank you. So, I have a polling question. So, I know that you were right last time around, but many weren't. Uh, you were right for you this time around, and many were. So, what changed for everybody else? What did they get right this time? Um, so, oh, sorry, yes. We'll, we'll take over. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I've heard a lot of people in recent days quoting Lord Helsham's remark that the uh, Westminster system produces an elective dictatorship. Does that still hold true today, given all the changes since when that was first set? <coughs> Do you think it, uh, there were any NGOs that were successful in influencing the election? Interesting. Interesting. Thank you. So, what did the polling industry get right this time? Uh, do we live in an elective dictatorship? Uh, and any influential NGOs? Uh, Meg, shall we start with? Yeah. Shall I just take the elective dictatorship? And I'll leave the other ones to others uh, because this is the sort of thing that I write on all the time. Um, I think that was never really true, uh, and it has become gradually less true. Um, although it's closer to true, if I can put it that way. Um, under a majority government, and particularly a substantial majority, than it, than it is otherwise. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, even at a time of majority government, um, the government, because of the confidence relationship with the House of Commons, is always dependent on maintaining the support of its own backbenchers, and there's much more negotiation that goes on behind the scenes with backbenchers to agree policy than many people often see. Um, at the, alongside that, uh, we have a much stronger House of Lords than we used to have. Um, we have things, some of the things actually on the page 48 slide, which people are beginning to worry about in terms of checks and balances. We have the Human Rights Act. Um, we, well, we have the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, you could say, which, doesn't, which means that the Prime Minister can't automatically get an election when he wants. Um, yeah, the House of Lords is stronger. We have the devolved bodies. Um, we have, of course, had European law, which has been a constraint and is increasingly not going to be a constraint. Um, so I think we don't live in an elected dictatorship, but it is undeniable that the executive now is going to be stronger than it has been for the last 10 years, at least. Um, and it is also threatening some of those checks and balances, which may lead to caution amongst some of the people who might otherwise be challenging. Alan. And just to add to that, um, one of the threats came during the, so the, the, there are the threats set out in page 48 of the Conservative Manifesto, but in addition there were threats during the campaign to independent <coughs> broadcasters, mm -hmm. uh, to Channel 4, uh, where they threatened to withdraw its public broadcasting license, and to the BBC, where there was talk about getting rid of the license fee during the campaign, now the talk seems more to be about and, uh, decriminalising not paying the license fee in order to slowly starve the BBC. Um, and that seems to me really troubling. Uh, the independent uh, media, particularly our broadcasters, are fundamental for the democratic system. Um, on successful NGOs, so um, I guess I'd like to talk about the positive ones. I mean, I think there are many um, concerns about how elections are conducted in the UK these days, but uh, there's some good work being done by some uh, sterling Democrats who believe in making things different. A full fact, I guess, is the most prominent. Uh, so the leading fact-checking organisation, which um, became much more prominent um, in this election than in past elections. Uh, I'm not sure if it counts as an, as an NGO, but the Institute for Fiscal Studies also played an absolutely fundamental role in uh, skewering the nonsense from both main parties. Um, and it's really vital that that, that happens. <coughs> there are also a number of organisations in the so-called civ tech sector, uh, so civic technology, um, seeking to um, use technology in order to promote 
um, better than democracy. So Democracy Club is probably the most prominent of those uh, which uh, uh, noticed that we just don't have basic information in, in British elections. So if you want to find out information about your candidates in your constituency, who they are, what their backgrounds are, what, they, what, what, what they've done, can't find it. No, no one thinks to provide that, that sort of information until Democracy Club came along. And they, they do provide um, information uh, on that on their website. They also power quite a lot of the um, the plugins in, in, in websites that you can you can get to tell you where your polling station is. That, 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 that kind of thing. So I think um, there are lots of positive contributions coming from a range of different NGOs. Um, from my perspective. Uh, there's still a lot more work to be done uh, in, in that area um, in order really to get... So those of you who've been to Constitution Unit events in, in the past will, will know that uh, I have done quite a lot of work over the past year on improving information uh, in election and referendum campaigns. And I think um, these are starting points upon which we can build, but a lot more work still needs to be done. Thank you. Um, so I also would like to talk about the role of the NGOs. Um, well, because the democracy club, I was surprised about the fact that in the UK there is no consolidated, there is no institution that consolidates all the electoral information. So if you want to do, for example, research on candidates, literally you have to sit down and download every single SOPN, like all the data, and you have to create the data set by yourself, which is so time consuming that by the time an election happens, you have no clue who you are looking at. Uh, like really, it's very, it's very time consuming. But this year, I mean, they did a fantastic job, and you can see almost in real time how they were um, just collecting all the data, and I think it was great. Uh, the Fawcett, I mean, related to women's issues, for example, the Fawcett Foundation has been doing a lot of pressure and to empower women uh, in politics in the country, and also to um, make parties um, compromise into taking the issue seriously. So they have been like one of the main advocates. Um, the Joe Cox Foundation also they have done a great like a lot of work and great deal on putting the issue of uh, toxic politics um, polarization but also how we have to take seriously the security and yeah, harassment and intimidation of mainly parliamentarians but they, they have been working very hard on putting the issue in the agenda and the parliamentary project in Scotland they mainly work in Scotland but they have great projects on how to empower women and how to make them not, I mean, it's people that are mainly interested in politics but need the last push to become candidates. So they provide training and um, yeah, and coaching for women who would like to be more active in politics. So I think they have been great. Then I think the polling question yeah, is yours. Yeah, so the, on the polling question, I think one has to go back further to 2015 to sort of understand the trajectory of what's happened with polling over the now three elections. 2015, essentially all the pollsters got things wrong using largely similar methods, got, them, got it wrong in the same way. They had labor too high, conservatives too low. There were a couple of very particular features of the 2015 election that I think were part of that story. One was the collapse of the Lib Dem vote, and the other was the rise of the UKIP vote happening at the same time. And in a sort of endemic problem with polling is some people are more inclined to answer polls than others. And if that turns out to be associated with the changes in how people are voting, you're going to have big problems in any kind of polling. And so one of the things that the old Lib Dem coalition of 2010 had a sort of interesting mix of sort of social liberals in urban areas and sort of more protest voters um, against the two-party system. There was a fair amount of traffic from, from Lib Dem to, to UKIP between 2010 and 2015, as well as other patterns of movement. But the, one of the issues that 2015 raised was sort of, in some sense, people, all the models had the wrong type of Lib Dem. Some people had conveniently forgotten that they voted Lib Dem in 2010 because they felt sheepish about it. Um, and then you had this problem that you would, they would vastly overrepresent the kind of Lib Dems that go labor versus the kind that went elsewhere. So 2017 rolls around, and what pollsters did, a large number of them simply sort of took a, a relatively simplistic lesson from 2015, which is, we're going to underestimate the Tories, and then did a whole bunch of things to essentially try to fix that problem. 
And, and the causes of that problem were not there in the same way in 2017 relative to 2015 as they had been in 2015 relative to 2010. And so they sort of overdid it. And in some cases, very explicitly, sort of like we're you know, doing things that were just guaranteed to move the number six points, and that was a mistake. Um, this time, a lot of that got unwound. People largely went back to the methods they used in 2015, which would be a problem if we had the 2015 election again. <laughs> And 2010 was the baseline for looking at how swings happen, but that was not the situation we were in. And crucially, there was one really useful additional piece of information that was there in 2017 and is there for this election was how people voted in the referendum, which very conveniently cuts that dimension of that is strongly associated with actually responding to polls. And so you can, with knowing how people voted in the referendum, you get a lot of information about are they the kind of person who is likely to be overrepresented in our sample, the remainers, versus the kind of people who are likely to be underrepresented, and you can actually fix it. Now, thinking about the next election, there's a question of how long can we go on doing polling that waits to people's referendum vote into the future? You know, will we be comfortable asking in 2023, 2024 how people voted in a referendum in 2016? Um, maybe this is a lasting cleavage that people will not forget and will not change what they say, um, but at a certain point, it becomes difficult to continue to use that. It's useful precisely because we know the right answer, or at least we know the right answer in 2016. The right answer for the 2024 electorate is going to have evolved some way from 2016. There are going to be a lot of new voters. There are going to be a lot of no longer available to vote voters. Um, and so those are going to be significant um, challenges to continuing to use that actually quite powerful piece of information. So I, I don't think. I don't think pollsters should go away from this election and think that, oh, we've got it all figured out. I think we may well see problems coming from these sort of ongoing challenges and getting certain kinds of people to engage with polls versus others, um, which might once again be predictive of how changes are, you know, how people are changing their mind. I just wanted to add one more comment on the NGO question, which is, <clears throat> I mean, I'll note on, on the Democracy Club, it was very useful for us. We were able, so I was working with YouGov, and we were able to get candidate lists per constituency into the field um, two day, no, one day, one day after the close of nominations because of the Democracy Club website. And, you know, it had some errors at the beginning. We were able to sort them out over the next few days, but, you know, that was quite useful for us for sort of getting people the right candidates and the right party choices in front of them earlier to enable us to do better analysis of sort of what the likely local dynamics were. And the last kind of NGO that I think um, the jury is out on, but people will still be looking at is tactical voting websites, our NGOs. Um, and um, the very early evidence I've seen some, I mean, at this point it's Twitter, Twitter comments from academics. Uh, Chris Hanready has a series of tweets on this, sort of finding what he thought was an implausibly large effect of tactical voting website advice, sort of basically comparing the places that were sort of just just edged over into being a Lib Dem recommendation versus just edged over into being a Labor recommendation and seeing a substantial gap in actual vote choice in those place, across those otherwise fairly similar places. Um, my sense is the technical voting websites probably did, did something. Um, and our, what we certainly saw over the campaign was consolidation of vote into the top two parties in each seat. Um, and so that, you know, how much of that was driven by the tactical, tactical voting websites versus the parties having campaigns and, you know, investing resources in some places versus another um, is a little bit unclear and we may never entangle, uh, did completely disentangle, but I think there's good reason to believe that, you know, in terms of moving votes, just sheer moving votes, you know, technical voting websites are probably going to be up there. I mean, they're viewed in some sense at this point as a failure by people on the Remain side. Um, that need not be the case. It might well have been that the majority would be even bigger without them. Um, we won't, we won't know that, but we'll get some indirect evidence on it in the coming weeks. Great, another round, please. Okay, um, so we'll take uh, the gentleman in the passenger shirt here, um, mm -hmm. the gentleman in red at the back, and the gentleman here. Okay. Okay. Please, please. 
Um, well, first of all, just continuing the observation, um, Alan, you said that, that um, Johnson will feel uh, obliged to fulfil on his promises to people in the north. I wonder why he hasn't fulfilled only promises. So. <laughs> um, uh, but the question really for me was, um, if in the referendum, as I think most of us would assume, there were a lot of don't normally votes that affected the outcome, to what extent did don't normally votes affect the general election outcome? Thank you. Oh, and can we see your slides <laughs> afterwards? <laughs> and, just on the point about NGOs, I thought one body that probably qualifies as that was spectacularly successful at hijacking the general election to get its point across as the Jewish labour movement. Whether you think its intervention was positive or negative depends on your point of view, which you could hardly miss it. However, the question I wanted to ask was um, about there were the demographic drivers behind this election. If we set Scotland and Northern Ireland aside, look at the rest of the country, clearly there wasn't a uniform national swing. Seats that were changing hands and concentrating one part of the country rather than another. Now if we go back to the referendum in the 2017 general election, we heard a lot about the youth of Quake. We heard a lot about the suggestion that the referendum had held two years of country and had a different outcome because there was a generational difference in people's attitude towards Brexit. It's never entirely clear whether that was a cohort effect or an age effect, whether there's sort of a voting habits that were going to stay with people as they age, or whether they're going to leave them behind and end the behaviour of their uh, seniors. But what I'm curious about is the extent to which do we know at all, if there isn't uniform swing across the country, this sort of demographic factor was driving it. Thank you. And My name is Bruce Nixon. We hear a lot about the nonsense of the will of the people. The Electoral Reform Society comes up with some very, very interesting data, which shows, I've got all the details here, I'll, I won't make it too detailed, but it shows that if we had the DONT system uh, used, I think, in Germany and the EU, the result would have been very, very different. In fact, the Tories would have um, and would have come down to 288 seats, and the um, what would I call the left-leaning <coughs> parties would have had 326, as opposed to the right-leaning 298. So it would have been a very different result. And I'm just I'd like to have your comments on that. Whether you know, bearing that in mind, whether what happened is really valid. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have. Um, questions on you know, those who don't normally vote, on the demographic drivers of, of vote change, um, and on the effect of the electoral system. Alan, shall I ask you first on the electoral um, system? Yeah, electoral system, yes. Um, so is the result valid? Yes. Um, the result um, um, was obtained through the rules that exist in law. Uh, those rules um, have been in place for a long time, and, um, you know, um, a, a result is validly obtained through them. Uh, so, I mean, I don't think we should be um, campaigning in the streets to, to uh, somehow overturn the result of the election. Uh, whether we should be trying to overturn the electoral system for next time uh, is an interesting question. Um, so, I've published several books on electoral systems, and every time I research electoral systems more, I get even less clear on which electoral system I think is best. <laughs> um, and you've, you've, you've set out the kernel of the case for a more proportional system there, and that uh, um, how, how can it be fair that, uh, as I put up on the slide, that a majority of voters vote for ref parties that want a referendum, but a majority of seats go to a single party that opposes a, a referendum. It looks pretty unfair. Um, but, first of all, we don't know what the votes would have been had there been a different voting system. Um, so, I mean, we know that some votes were cast tactically, so clearly the votes would have been different under a different voting system. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's entirely possible that some people voted for Liberal Democrats in the expectation that there was going to be a Conservative majority, because that's what the polls were suggesting, so it was safe to vote Lib Dem, but if they had really been pushed to it, they would have preferred Bar Bar Cor Johnson over Corbyn. <coughs> so, you know, there, there are all sorts of effects, effects like that. Um, and then secondly, uh, the proportionality of the result is only one of the desirable features in an election outcome. 
and uh, ha having um, a clear result uh, is also, a, 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 in my view at least, a desirable feature in an electoral system. It's often said that single party majority government is better government, it's more stable and produces better governing outcomes. Actually there's no evidence for that. Um, the um, uh, economies do not perform markedly different under proportional systems versus first past the post systems, for example. Um, but accountability on the whole is clearer if you have a single party majority government and voters know whom to blame uh, or whom to praise uh, if they don't like or they do like what happens. So um, there are good arguments for different electoral systems and I have no clear view of which is best. <laughs> um, I think these are very much voting voting questions so I'm happy to pretty much leave them with um, Alan and Ben in particular and Sophia if she wants to comment but I, I would just throw in one, one comment I, I guess in, in addition to what Alan said here because I think there is something that's a bit different about this election I mean I I'm, I'm not a voting systems expert like Alan is but I do teach voting systems to my students and one of the things that I say is that it's not really right to judge first past the post on the national vote shares because that's not what it's about it's about 650 individual constituency decisions and if you think that that's a sort of valid logic then you shouldn't expect it necessarily to match national vote shares but I think this election is a bit different because it was kind of a proxy referendum <laughs> and it doesn't so much make sense to add up 650 different views on the leave remain question and then for one of those, for the winning side to be boosted as a result of the electoral system. Um, I think that's perhaps why people are feeling a bit more, um, a bit more sore at this result than they, than they usually are, because it was sort of, it was a muddle of, is it an election or is it a referendum, and it, is it about parties or is it about leave remain? Um, so as a non-UK <coughs> citizen. Um, for me, I mean, of course, there is the generational replacement and how generations go together. If whether the question of whether cleavages have been changing so much that, that actually motivates the swings and the variation across uh, districts in the country or species in the country. However, I, for me at least, is it was very clear from the beginning that this was a Brexit campaign, right? As I said, like, I mean, it was a kind of proxy for a second referendum. And you have one party that has very clear positions, yeah, get Brexit done, etc. And then you have one party that remains, like, and it's a major party, right? Um, that remains very ambiguous about... Excuse me, sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> about uh, what, like, where to stand. And I think, in general, I mean, it's complicated. I, I think that if you know, if you are a Brexit, like, a pro-leave, you know who to vote for. If you're a Remainer, then who? Like, it was just not very clear. So the, the, the left, the country is so fractionalized that it's very complicated to think in terms of what might be driving the differences. So it can be tactical voting, it can be different cleavages, or it can be as well demographics. But I don't think that in two years, the changes in demographics were so big. Uh, that's my opinion. And, um, first past the post versus uh, majority system, uh, I mean, versus proportional representation. I just want to also add on that to say that there are goods and bad, but on the one hand, it also, like having a first past the post system prevents extreme parties from raising and gaining power. So, in a way, like the, yes, we are talking a lot about polarization in the UK and so on, but we don't observe the rise of the super far right and how they get strength as we can uh, be observing it in other countries. And finally, uh, that localism is a key thing in the UK politics, so that people in general tend or want to vote for a candidate that knows a district very well, and this is something that is more difficult to attain in a proportional representation. So one more point on, on PR, which is simply to note that the national vote shares we observed in this election would not have happened had this been a proportion, a system, an election fought under PR. The Brexit party would not have stood down um, in half the seats. 
they also would have been an appealing vote for many people over the Conservative Party. Now, would they have received 6% of the vote, 8% of the vote, 10, 12, 14? It's hard to know, but it could have been quite substantial. Um, and, you know, similarly, you know, you would have seen probably, well, hard to even know exactly how the Labour and Lib Dem and Green side of the equation splits out, but I'm sure the Green vote would have been higher. The Lib Dem vote might have been higher. That one, I think, is less clear. Um, you would have been looking at that 52-48 um, par parliament, but not necessarily in the direction that we saw here. Um, and you would have had sort of now some very interesting coalition negotiations um, where potentially the Green Party or the Brexit Party is pivotal to the ability of one side or the other to form a governing coalition. And, you know, people will debate whether that's a more appealing result of an election or not. But I think, you know, there's at least an interesting conversation to be had there. And if you're going to sort of examine the counterfactual of what would have happened under PR, you actually also do have to take seriously the question of how people would have voted if they hadn't faced all those local tactical considerations. Um, the question at the, at the back um, about the demographic changes, I think one of the things that I found quite interesting watch, sort of looking at a lot of data on this, this election was, for the most part, it was 20, it was sort of watching the same changes that happened in 2015 to 17 sort of happen, keep happening more. You know, so People switched votes between 2015 and 17, and a lot of that was structured by their views about Brexit. And then that happened again. So even having moved a bunch of people, sort of sorted them into parties that had Brexit positions that were largely consistent with theirs, you know, Labour Party position being always a challenge to think about here. Um, it, it, this process happened again, and more Leave voters left Labour who had stuck with Labour in 2017, and more Conservative Remainers left largely to the Lib Dems rather than to Labour. Um, and if you look at just sort of people who switched parties, many people switched sort of within Brexit coalitions, but of the people who move across them, the vast majority of them move to reconcile their Brexit position with their party position. And, and that does seem to have structured a lot of the movement. And what that means is sort of as far, sort of side effects of that is um, the age gradient, if anything, looks to have gotten larger. Um, it was already very large at the last election, but again, you know, that's sort of, you know, some of that may be directly about age and, and culture and perceptions and cohorts and so forth. Um, but a lot of it is sort of side effect of, of the structure of, of support for Brexit. Um, and similarly, sort of the age, the, sort of the education gradients that have started to build up with people with higher educational qualifications being more likely to support labor um, and people with lesser formal qualifications um, being more likely to, to support the conservative party. Those gradients have also gotten bigger. Um, one of the consequences of this is, and that people have noticed is sort of the social class gradient has basically gone away. The sort of the traditional <coughs> labor conservative social class gradient is basically gone now. And sort of, I think the question will be more or less like whether it's actually gone into reverse a bit um, as better data comes in um, over the coming months. So there's, it was a continuation of the 2015-17 changes, um, and I think a, a really important question for understanding what British politics looks like in 10, 20, 30 years is precisely this question about whether these are lasting cohort effects. Um, we know they such things exist. They are, let's hope for Labour, so. um, Eventually, yes. Um, and if they are, um, and what I was going to say is we know these things exist sort of from sort of the long running election studies that exist in um, the US and the UK, that there are these sort of detectable generational effects that seem to persist, you know, as people age, sort of this group of ages, you know, this group of birth years just, you know, is a bit more, you know, in the US Democrat versus Republican or here Labor versus Conservative. Um, in the past, they haven't been huge effects, but it's also not been the case that there's been anything like the age gradient we observe right now. So I think it's a very open question whether that is a massive bump that sort of ages, in which case it has sort of quite striking consequences for the future prospects of the Labour Party. Um, 
or, and, you know, conversely for the Conservative Party, or whether there's, you know, sort of other things that happen that sort of smooth that out over time. We, I think we'll, we'll find out, but not soon. Great. It's 7.15, so we'll take one final round of questions. Can I reiterate my plea for the women in the audience to put their hands up as well? <laughs> The present government clearly wishes to retain the unity of the United Kingdom, so how can it best uh, uh, prevent, that is, the secessionist noises both from uh, Scotland and from Northern Ireland? Thank you. That's true. I think it's right that we asked them question about the electoral system and I like uh, Alan's answer that after having written several books on the electoral system he doesn't know which system is the best <laughs> and I'm not surprised it is not just a question about the electoral system we are asking about democracy as such and what is the result of the vote voting system and if we go to German uh, uh, Delta, we know that is the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people <laughs> what about the minority and that's where the electoral system comes back and if you consider that at the moment we have been experiencing change at almost exponential rate rather than linear and will continue and what will normally take say a decade will now take two years at most, we have to expect an absolute earthquake in the British politics in the next few years, including the change of the constitution, the constitution unit is here, uh, and therefore my question is, not just about the electoral system, yes, because the first the first past the post it must go in my view. We should rather think about the consensual politics with the president with, with extremely uh, range of powers, because we'll be dealing with events which will happen at the lightning speed and the decision won't be made by the parliament, it will have to be by a single person. Yeah. And we have to prepare for that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, John Strafford. Um, just comment on the selection of women in the uh, uh, candidates, uh, and that is that in the Conservative <coughs> Party, the number of women that apply to be candidates is direct, directly related to the number that gets selected. Uh, and I did a study for the party board on that issue. Well, I wonder, my question relates, though, to what Alan and Meg had to say about control uh, and dictatorship. Uh, and the question really is, is who chooses the candidates? Because in this general election, we saw both Labour Party and Conservative Party and Brexit delay until the last, very last moment, the choosing of the candidates. And the effect of that was that in the Conservative Party, half a dozen unelected, unaccountable people determined who the candidates were going to be. And it got even worse because at the end, it was down to four people, Ben Elliott, Dominic Cummings and two others, who were actually determining the candidates. Uh, and uh, in my own constituency of Beaconsfield, uh, which is the greatest, uh, uh, largest membership constituency of the Conservative Party, previous elections we've had two to three hundred applicants. This time we were forced to accept from three candidates, and if we didn't accept the three, the party chairman alone would then determine who the candidate would be. Uh, and the three that we uh, were given was the constituency chairman, a, a female uh, for gender balance, uh, and uh, the third one was a candidate who had been rejected by the constituency 20 years ago. <laughs> um, uh, I'm delighted to tell you that we uh, actually selected the uh, female who was streets ahead of everybody else, uh, but wasn't part of central office's plan. Um, and, uh, but, but, uh, out of this situation, half a dozen people are choosing the candidates to become the MPs that form the government of this country. And the media ignore it, and dare I say, the academics ignore it as well. <laughs> well, we'll tackle it up. <laughs> so we have um, questions on how we maintain the union, a nice small topic to start with, um, consensual versus presidential politics, um, and you know, who chooses the candidates and a note that you know, uh, there may be a question about how many women apply to the candidates as well as how many stand. So, Sophia, can I pass that to you first? Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, well, that's very interesting. It's true that a lot of research has said unless women are, like, present themselves forward, right? That, I mean, that in general, the committee select among women that are already there and that um, have expressed some 
not an ambition to be in politics. However, um, more research has been shown that actually women have ambition and that women want to be there, but we follow different paths to actually put our name forward. Now the mechanisms that work for men don't really work for women because for many structural factors we need to be encouraged more. So in general now the trend is just to suggest that actively scoop among women who would like to put themselves forward. So I know that is asking perhaps partisan committees to do more because <coughs> it's um, basically an active search instead of a passive selection. Um, this is what I can say. So that in general it requires larger effort. If we want to increase the number of women or female candidates, it really requires more like active participation. Um, I wouldn't say any of these three are squarely within my, my area of competency, but I will say just a few things um, on this, this last question. Um, I think it's quite, so the, the record of sort of in some sense, primary elections is mixed if you look across different systems. And um, there are reasons why parties might wish to control, sit more centrally, the, the selection process. I mean, I think there's an in, you know, in the UK, there's interesting and, and sort of varied structures in the different parties regarding sort of exactly how much control and at which times the central party office can sort of dive in, but there's, there are good reasons why they have that power, largely ha down to sort of replacing problematic candidates at the last moment. Um, so I think we have seen in this election, both within the Conservative Party and the Labour Party, a sort of very top-down approach, and a lot of sort of highly structured choices being given to, to constituencies of people who might not, none of whom might be the preferred candidate of, of the constituency party. Um, I think it's very difficult to, um, well, I, 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 I don't see any prospects from anything that I've heard to sort of ameliorate this in, in part because it's very much in the central party's interest to maintain that control. Um, so on John Newell's question about uh, uh, preventing secession. How, how, how can the government prevent secession? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the difficulty, it seems to me, if you look at the impact of Brexit upon independent sentiment in Scotland, so um, Northern Ireland is slightly different, but Scotland, um, there's the head case for independence and there's a the heart case for independence. Um, the impact of Brexit is clearly to strengthen the heart case for independence. Scotland is actually against this thing, it's having Brexit forced upon it by the evil English. Uh, escaping that uh, clearly uh, feels good. <laughs> but Brexit also makes the head case for independence much harder. Uh, if you're going to have an EU border mm. between Scotland and England, mm. Uh, is that really uh, go going to help the Scottish economy? Is that a really good, really a good idea? Um, and if you're thinking about what the government needs to do in order to prevent secession, then it entirely depends on whether it's the head case or the heart case that is more important. Um, if, if, the heart, if it's the heart that matters, then you want to have the softest possible Brexit, be very emollient, be nice, be lovely. If it's the head that, that matters, make that border hard. Uh, and the, the, the head argument, the economic argument against Scottish independence gets even stronger. And I don't think, but Ben's a public opinion expert, so maybe he, he, he knows better, but I, I don't see any evidence on which we can judge the degree to which the head case or the heart case, heart case is likely to win out. Uh, in that debate. So, who knows? <laughs> On the other two questions, um, just taking them together, I think it, um, so, this is stealing some of Meg's make, territory, but it's often said that the UK has a Westminster system and a uh, Westminster model of democracy. And that was defined by a great political scientist called Arendt Leiphardt in terms of a range of dimensions that basically mean that power is concentrated in a few hands. You've got um, the first-past-the-post voting system, you have 
traditionally at least no decentralization, uh, you have uh, no uh, written constitution, a very weak judicial review, and so on. This model ignores some of the really important checks and balances that mean that, as Meg said earlier, we've never actually had elective dictatorship. So it ignores the fact that parties traditionally have had quite a lot of decentralization within them. Um, it ignores um, the fundamentally important role of the UK's particularly independent-minded media. Uh, it ig ignores the role of the independent civil service. Um, and I think when we suppose that uh, we're going to have an earthquake unless we change the electoral system, we're forgetting all of those other checks and balances within the system. But that's why what Meg was saying about page 48 of the manifesto is particularly important, Conservative manifesto, because that seems to me to threaten an attack on uh, some of the often forgotten <laughs> checks and balances uh, that exist within the political system. And we, when we have a government that tried unlawfully to shut down Parliament, right. that uh, has attacked uh, the, our independent media institutions during the uh, uh, election campaign, um, that has basically indicated that the means justify the ends, it strikes me that we need to work, and it's really important that we protect and stand up for the checks and balances that exist within our system. Meg, the last couple of minutes is yours. Mm. Alan makes it very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would also going to focus on those two questions together. Um, one little piece of trivia that I picked up yesterday um, on Twitter was, I don't know whether anybody out there has been a language learner and come across a little app called Memrise, which gives you cards for remembering words. Uh, everybody looks completely blank. Um, somebody shared yesterday that uh, Memrise has actually made one of the new uh, MPs. Uh, which is tremendously useful for clerks. I think it was a clerk who shared it. You can see their pictures and their names and you can practice so that you can learn who they all are. And so I went through it and I was rather shocked to find uh, a picture of a, an extremely Corbynite former councillor from my area. I thought, how on earth did that person become an MP? I never heard that. Picked in the week before the election uh, by the centre, clearly. Uh, so you, you, that's going on in the Conservative Party, it's going in the Labour Party. Um, I appreciate what you say about it being a problem. It is quite hard to see sometimes when things get very tight, what you do right up to an election, but uh, you, know, you, you do make an important point. The thing that you don't uh, touch on, and I think here I'm pushing in slightly opposite direction to you in terms of you wanting to democratise inside parties, um, <coughs> is whether the, um, democ the democratisation inside the Labour Party of the leadership contest has not been utterly catastrophic um, and to, to my mind uh, has created a completely unsustainable situation which is weakening to Parliament where you have a parliamentary party led by a leader in which it has no confidence. Uh, this has actually weakened the role of Parliament and weakened the chain of delegation, if you like, from the public uh, to the people who lead them and we are about to see how it performs uh, once again. Um, but I think we ought to be questioning that personally, which kind of leads to the other uh, gentleman's question about, you presented it as it's not just electoral systems, it's what form of democracy we want to live under. And I think you are completely right. And I think that these points on this slide, um, you know, there are some very fundamental points here about balance between different institutions. And I said in my opening remarks that we've been through a very exciting, fascinating roller coaster ride uh, about the role of Parliament, the role of the courts, the role of the executive. For whatever reason they want to look at it, I think we should all be looking at it, actually, uh, because I think that you know, the polarisation that was described at the back the levels of anger, the levels of disconnect between people and their politics, the extent to which people feel that Parliament doesn't represent them, none of this is sustainable. And so actually I think we do need to be asking some quite big questions about the type of democracy that we live in. But the bit of that that isn't up on the slide is, I've got it in front of me, they want to set up a commission to look at it. I don't think it should be for a small commission. I think it should be for a big public conversation. 
uh, because a bit like what John says about choosing candidates, it's not something that you want done by a clique around a leader who has a particular agenda. Yeah. It's something actually that everybody should be getting engaged in, because yeah, we need yeah. to reconnect people with our politics, yeah, yeah. and the Constitution Unit you know, will be coming back to all of these issues uh, in future <laughs> events and publications. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>